So what we've learned already is that the change in enthalpy of a reaction can be calculated using standard enthalpies of formation, doing products minus reactants, Hess's law, or from bond enthalpies, doing bonds broken minus bonds formed. We've also learned that the amount of heat absorbed by a system under constant pressure and its expansion work is equal to the change in enthalpy of the system. Change in enthalpy is defined as heat transfer to the system, assuming constant pressure on only expansion work. In this video, we'll talk about heat capacity. Heat capacity is important because we can use it to calculate how much heat is needed for a change in temperature, or how, what's the change in temperature given how much heat was transferred. What you should be able to do after watching this video is be able to describe the meaning of heat capacity, compare and contrast heat capacity and enthalpy, calculate the, be able to calculate the amount of heat transferred to or from the system given the change in temperature, and be able to calculate the change in temperature given the amount of heat transferred to or from the system. So a question we could look at is how much heat has to be added to 36 grams of ice at zero degrees Celsius to melt it. Now whenever you're given a question about phase transition or reaction, we always think about change in enthalpy. And so going from a solid to a liquid, that change in enthalpy is enthalpy of fusion. And so we use enthalpy of fusion. Enthalpy of fusion for ice is 6.01 kilojoules. And so we need 6.01 kilojoules of heat for every mole of ice to melt it. Now on a problem, we're given 36 grams, and so we have to convert 36 grams to moles. So we divide by the molar mass, then multiply by the 6.01, and we get 12.02 kilojoules. And so 12.02 kilojoules of heat has to be added to 36 grams of ice to melt it. And so again, whenever you have a reaction or a phase transition, we have to use the chain of enthalpy to calculate the heat. Now if we have just a change in temperature, then we use a heat capacity. Now heat capacity can be defined for an object, symbolized with just a C, or the molar heat capacity, which is heat capacity per mole, and that symbolized with C with subscript M, or specific heat capacity, which is heat capacity per gram, and that symbolized with the C and subscript S. And so to determine how much heat to, to, is absorbed and emitted when there's a change in temperature, we have to use heat capacity. And heat capacity is just the ratio of heat transfer to um, compared to the change in temperature. And so this is a really kind of cool graph. Imagine that we're starting with ice below zero degrees Celsius. Any heat that we add goes straight into changing in temperature. And so once we get to zero degrees Celsius, now any heat we add goes into our phase transition. Once we've converted all the ice to liquid, any heat we added again goes to change in temperature. Once we've gotten all the liquid to 100 degrees Celsius, any heat we add actually causes a change in phase, going from liquid to the gas. And again, once everything's been confirmed to steam, any heat added goes into change in temperature. You should also remember that the more motion at the atomic level, the higher the internal energy and the enthalpy. Enthalpy of a gas is always higher than the enthalpy corresponding liquid, which is always higher than the enthalpy of the corresponding solid. But whenever phase transitions, we use a change in enthalpy, and notice that during phase transitions, there is no change in temperature. When there is no phase transition and it's only change in temperature, then we have to use heat capacity. Now it's kind of interesting, we could ask, you know, where does the heat go when heat is added and there's no change in phase? And so heat actually goes into the internal energy of the system, increase the amount of atomic level motion. This is a very decent movie of, of water at 25 degrees Celsius, it's been slowed down dramatically, but we can see the water molecules are all moving, their, their translational motion, their rotational motion, and there's vibrational motion. And so there's three types of atomic level motion, translation, rotation, and vibration. And so this is actually where the heat goes when you're heating an object. Now translation, there's actually three translational degrees of freedom. We, do, we live in a three-dimensional space if you don't include time, and so you have three translational degrees. All gases have three translational degrees of freedom. For nonlinear molecules, there's three rotational degrees of freedom because you can rotate about three different axes. For linear molecules, you only have two rotational degrees of freedom because if you rotate about the bond axis, the nuclei do not move, and so that does not count as a rotational degree of freedom. A single atom by itself, for example, noble gas, has zero rotational degrees of freedom. Again, if you rotate it and it doesn't move the nucleus, it doesn't count. Vibrational degrees of freedom is equal to the three times the number of 
atoms of the molecule minus the number of translational rotational degrees of freedom. And so for nonlinear molecules, the number of vibrational modes is equal to 3n minus 6 because there's 6 translational degrees of freedom and 6 rotate. Sorry, there's 3 translational degrees of freedom and 3 rotational degrees of freedom. For linear molecules, the number of vibrational modes is equal to 3n minus 5 because, again, there's 3 translational degrees of freedom and 2 rotational degrees of freedom. And so the vibrational degrees of freedom for water, you have 3 molecules, so 3 times 3 is 9 minus 6, so that gives you 3, tra three vibrational degrees of freedom. And so these are the vibrational modes for water. If we look at ammonia, we have four atoms, four times six is 12, minus six is six. And so you have six vibrational modes of vibration for ammonia. Now he can go into translational, rotational, and vibrational degrees of freedom. At low temperatures, heat is just going into translational. And then as you raise the temperature, it's going translational, rotational. And then heat only goes into vibrational degrees of freedom at high temperatures because the spacing between the different states is much larger for vibrational than translational, rotational. And so here we have the plot of the molar heat capacity as a function of temperature for I2. Initially, as you're heating it, the heat's always going to translation. And then eventually, you start going translational, rotation. That's why the heat capacity increases. Notice heat capacity changes with temperature. And if you get high enough temperature, you're putting heat into translational, rotational, and vibrational degrees of freedom. If you heat it too high, the iodine molecules disassociate, forming two I's, um, atoms. And then notice that you have just translational, and that's going to be twice the initial translational degrees of freedom, because now you have twice as many atoms. So at low temperatures, only translational contributes to heat capacity because it requires the lowest amount of energy to excite. At higher temperatures, you can do translational rotational. At even higher temperatures, you start exciting the vibrational on degrees of freedom. And then again, eventually, the two molecules disassociate forming two I atoms. And so here's three columns with heat capacities. Um, again, C is for heat capacity, P is for constant pressure, and M is molar. And so on the left-hand column, we have normal gases. And so there's no rotational degrees of freedom. And so only translational. They all have the same heat capacity because they only have the three translational degrees of freedom. The middle column, we have diatomics. And so you have translational and rotational. And so their heat capacity is a little bit uh, larger because there's more places to put the heat. And then right-hand column, we have nonlinear molecules. And so they have three rotational degrees of freedom, three translational degrees of freedom. Of the molecules, these, these have the highest heat capacity. And so a question we can look at is how much heat energy would be required, required to raise the temperature of one mole of gases at, by 10 degrees under constant pressure. And so we're looking at argon, nitrogen, and methane. Again, the more places you add to put the heat, the higher the heat capacity, the more heat you have to add for the same change in temperature. And so methane has the most number of uh, modes where to put the heat, so it has a large heat capacity, and so it's going to need the most heat for the same change in temperature. And so the heat capacity is just ratio between heat and change in temperature. We can solve for heat, and so heat is equal to heat capacity times the change in temperature. And so for a 10 degree change in temperature for one mole, we see the argon just requires 207.9, while methane requires 253.1. More places to put the heat higher heat capacity, more heat for the same degree change in temperature. We could also ask how much heat would be required to raise the temperature of 10 grams of argon by 20 degrees. And so the molar mass of argon is 40, the molar heat capacity is 20.8. And so we have to convert from um, grams to moles. And we can do these calculations without memorizing the equation just by looking at unit analysis. And so notice that grams cancel grams, moles cancel moles. Um, now, degrees Celsius and Kelvin usually won't cancel, but when you have a change in temperature, they are the same. And so temperature in, in Celsius and Kelvin are very different. Zero degrees Celsius is corresponds to 273 Kelvin, but a temperature change in Celsius and Kelvin are exactly the same. So going from a 0 to 100 degrees Celsius is exactly the same as going 273 to 373. And so Celsius and Kelvin change in temperature can cancel. And so heat capacity for an object is symbolized with just a C. 
molar heat capacity, heat capacity per mole has C and the subscript M. Specific capacity is heat capacity per gram, C subscript S. And so a 100 gram block of copper has a heat capacity of 38 joules per Celsius with a CM and CS. And so that's for the object. And again, heat capacity for an object is important when you're doing calorimetry. You'll talk often about the heat capacity of the calorimeter. And often then you'll try to determine the molar heat capacity or specific capacity of the compound that you're looking at. And so to convert from heat capacity of the object to the molar heat capacity, you just have to divide by the number of moles. To convert from heat capacity of the object to specific capacity, you just divide by the number of grams. We could ask how much heat is needed to be absorbed by the block to raise it 10 degrees. And so Q, C, delta T. And so we get 380. If we use the molar heat capacity, we have to convert from grams to moles. And then multiply the heat capacity and then change the temperature. And to use the specific heat capacity, it's just going to be the grams, the mass, times the specific heat capacity, times the change in temperature. 